We saw in our last video that bias is a very, very bad thing. If you have biased results or biased samples, it means you have to toss everything. All your results, all your numbers, everything you calculate, it's all garbage. So if we want to think about that a little bit more, we realize that if you want to avoid bias because it's such a bad thing, that would help to actually know what bias is and what it looks like. So when you have a bias, it means that the values you're going to produce are going to be untrue. Now, there are three big ways that you can do this. One, you could have sampling bias. Two, you could have non-response bias. And three, you could have response bias. Okay, so let's look at these. Sampling bias. Sampling bias is when you take a sample that is not truly representative of the population. Now, this can come in a couple different ways. One, you could do a convenient sample. Convenient samples are a classic way to just completely ruin your data set. These are the kinds of things that they do on all of the TV shows where you call in for your favorite dancer, call in for your favorite singer. It's a convenient sample. Only the people that care enough to call and pay for the money to, for the call, etc., are going to bother to call. Um, similarly, you poll people on the street, you know, uh, Comedians at late night shows often make great fun of this. They will pull people coming out of the bars and who's the president and people don't know, things like that. That's a convenient sample. Convenient for the comedian because it makes it funny. Now an incomplete frame is when you have a list of people but your list is not complete. So let's say I wanted to call all the people in the US but I accidentally have every phone number in New York not on the list. That would be an incomplete frame. That wouldn't work. Or if I want to call all JC students but all the Hillsdale students are not on the list, for example, or all the female students are not on the list or whatever. That would mean that your, your list frame is just a big, it's a fancy name for list. Your list is not complete. Next, you can have non-response bias, which quite frankly happens sometimes when you have a convenient sample anyway, but it can be bigger than that. So it's when people don't respond or don't um, send back the survey, send back the questionnaire, that kind of thing. So for example, if you're called up and they say, hey, this is a poll and you hang up on them, you might be a different person than the kind of person that would sit there and talk to them and answer their questions. Now, there are ways that you can limit non-response. You can never actually make it disappear entirely because you're always going to have people that hang up. You're always going to have people that don't return the surveys, etc. So what you can do is you can re offer rewards, incentives, things like that. We have this at um, restaurants and uh, department stores all the time nowadays. So they give you your receipt and they say, you know, call this to answer the survey and you could win a hundred dollar prize you could win a two thousand dollar or this or you know a fifty dollar that what they're trying to do is they're trying to give you an incentive so that way you will call and answer their questions right so that would be a way to try to limit the non-response but you're always going to have non-response for example if you just think about restaurants you know that the vast majority of people that get a receipt do not bother to call in and tell them what they thought of the service or the food or whatever. They don't bother. So the way they, the re restaurants try to get around that is to try to offer them a gift certificate if they call in, things like that. All right, and last but not least, response bias. This is when the answers on a survey do not reflect the true feelings of the respondent for whatever reason. And then this can happen in a whole bunch of ways, and I've just listed some of them here. Um, the interviewer error. So the interviewer is untrustworthy or unskilled. They don't, um, when you're called for a survey, for example, they have to ask specific questions. If the interviewer messes up and doesn't ask them in the right order or doesn't ask the, the exact answer as it is written, they change the wording, etc., that would be interviewer error. Then you have misrepresented answers. So sometimes people just lie. They don't want to answer, so they'll tell you untruths, or they don't really know the truth, so they just kind of make it up. Or they um, not so much lie as tell little white lies to themselves. Oh, yes, I'm going to vote in that election, and they're not going to vote, things like that. Um, the wording of questions. How the questions are worded can often lead you towards specific answers. This has happened to me a lot in my life. I'll, I'll answer the phone and it's a polling station from a Republican Party or a Democratic Party. And you can tell in the way that they ask the questions, you know, don't you think that gun rights should be protected? Well, they're biasing me towards saying yes. Or don't you think, you know, this or that gun control should be, you know, legislation, that kind of thing. So they're biasing you in the way that they ask the question. All right, what about the order of questions? So let's say I want to do one about um, 
weapons and I'm, I'm pro, um, I don't know, Second Amendment rights. So I'll ask questions first about, you know, don't you think we have civil liberties? Don't you think we, you know, everybody should be able to do what they want in this country? And then they will ask about gun control, right? Whereas somebody wanting to bias it the other way will say, you know, here was the latest gun shooting massacre. What do you feel about that? Now, what do you feel about gun control? And of course, by asking you the question about the massacre first, it changes how you feel about gun control. Um, the type of question. So I, I hate this. So sometimes they will ask me a question and they will only let me say yes or no or true or false. And it's a more complicated answer than that. Lawyers like to do this to people all the time. You know, they, you know, did you do this? Well, yes, but all these other things happened and they don't want to hear the but. They just want to hear the yes or the no. Right. Um, that can create problems for you in your survey. And then, of course, data entry error. Somebody just typed something wrong. Somebody put something in wrong. You said 50 and the person that typed it typed 5,000. That's a different story. So those are all ways that you can bias your results. Now, keep in mind that sampling bias and sampling error are not the same thing. Sampling error I talked about back here, sampling error, it's resulting from the fact that you are taking a sample. Once you take a sample, it is not perfect. And since it's not a perfect representation of the population, you're going to have sampling error, right? Your, your sample is always a little bit off, right? Okay, whereas sampling bias is something totally different. Sampling bias means you've done something wrong, right? So sampling error is from the fact that different samples, um, different results will come from different samples. No sample is a perfect representation of the population. You're always gonna have a little bit of an error, but it doesn't mean you've made a mistake. It just means that your sampling is a little bit off. That's all it means. But all samples will always be a little bit off. You can't really avoid it. You can try to minimize it, but you can't avoid it. It will always be there. No sample is perfect. That's sampling error. Sampling bias comes from the fact that you did something wrong, right? You made a flaw. It is biased. Bias is a bad, bad thing. Bias is a severe mistake, and it means that you have to fix it, right? I only talk to people on the street. I ask them the wrong kinds of questions. I ask them leading questions, things like that. Those are biases, and those are things you do not want to do. the way you collected your your sample the way you collected your data is just wrong and it's going to make everything else wrong all right so now let's read and some of these and see which one we think these are so we have all of our list of convenient sample and complete frame all these good ones actually bad ones and we want to figure out which one each of these examples is so we want to poll students about salary negotiations for professors and these are all biased and so it's a question of how are they biased so the person making the phone calls reads the script incorrectly. Well, that's a classic example of number four, interviewer error. They're not reading the script correctly. They don't follow the script. Then that's an error. They always need to follow the script. The person typing in the answers accidentally types that a student wants professors to have a 25% pay raise. Whoa, that'd be quite large instead of a 2.5% pay raise. So that is data entry error. The person typing typed it wrong. Now, JC gets the names and phone numbers for students, but only from the fall semester. Well, that would be an incomplete frame. You don't want to just ask students from fall. You want to ask them from all semesters. So that would be number two. Now, this is interesting. The possible pay raise levels always start with the highest numbers, so students reply that one um, that one as it is the first in the list. This is actually a really common problem with the way that the question is designed, right? So the order in the question, the way the questions were asked is not good for you. It's not really the order of the questions. It's more the order of the words. So um, by always picking the one that's on the top, it, psychologically people tend to, to list the first thing that they hear more often than anything else. So in order to mitigate that factor, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll scramble. So for example, um, when uh, President Obama was up against Mitt Romney in the elections, what they did was they would call one time and they would say, who are you going to vote for, Romney or Obama? And then the next person they called would say, who are you going to vote for, Obama or Romney? And they would flip back and forth like that. And the reason they do that is to keep it from having a problem with the order, right? Because people tend to respond to the first name they hear, believe it or not. 
So this is actually a number seven. This is a bias in the way that you ordered the words in your questions, right? By ordering the words to always be the highest number first, you're biasing it towards a highest number. All right, students are called, but lots of them don't answer their phone. Well, I could see that happening. That would be a non-response bias. People see it's, you know, a JC, the number that's calling, and they don't feel like answering. They just won't answer, or they'll hang up. A professor gives the students surveys about their feelings about his class, but only asks his multiple choice questions and doesn't ask for further comments. All right? Well, I should say about salary. Well, by not asking for further comments, you're kind of limiting people. That can be a real big problem. So that's really the type of questions. I've seen surveys where they do that, where they just ask you false, or they just say, you know, rate your feelings on a scale of one to five, and there's no, but I didn't have this. I didn't, I have nothing to say about this, that kind of thing. All right, students say what they think the interviewer wants to hear, but they don't really believe it. That is lying, and so that would be number five. They are misrepresenting their answers. That would especially happen, say, um, with a professor. So if the professor gives you their student feedback form, you know, student survey, in the class, and they're standing right there watching you take it, you'll be like, oh, this is the best professor ever, because you don't feel like you can be truly honest. Or your parents, you know, say to you, well, have you ever done X that's a bad thing? Like, you know, I don't know, had a drink of alcohol or had premarital sex. And you'd be like, no, 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 I've never done that because you don't trust the interviewer. You don't want to actually tell them the truth. Not that you would, any of you would do that, but I'm just putting that out there for some people. All right. The question puts to students, um, put to students asks, you think the professors are overpaid, right? Well, that's a negative voice question, right? So that would be a badly 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 worded questions that's number six number six you word that question in a way that leads students to go uh, uh yeah professors are overpaid yeah yeah oh yeah right but they might not necessarily believe that but they are going to say it because of the way the question was worded next the dean of students walks over to one of the dorms on central campus and asks every student they can find what they think about instructor pay and benefits so they just start walking down the halls what do you think of instructor pay and benefits what do you think of instructor pay and benefits that is a convenient sample they're not really randomly doing this they're getting all the people that are willing to talk to them in a hallway that's convenience not not good at all Again, that's what nighttime comedians do. Right? All right, a survey is emailed to all students, but only 3% of students respond. Well, I could see that happening as well. Students are sometimes not as good as they should be about answering emails. So that would be a non-response bias, right? They're not answering back, and you really need the answer of a lot more people than 3% in order to get a good sense of what students really think. The president of the college conducts one-on-one -on -one interviews with students in his office. So. He calls you in, he sits you in his office, offers you a bottle of water and says, what do you think salad teachers should be paid here? Well, that's an intimidating situation. <laughs> yes, definitely. So that's really number four. Number five is actually probably going to result from this. Number five will result from this because the student will be intimidated. Last one. Um, oh, sorry, a number five will probably result from the student being intimidated, right? But it's definitely a number four. It's an interviewer error because the interviewer can make a mistake. That's one way to have an error with your interviewer, but it also can be your selection of interviewer. If you're having a person who's invested in this and can has power over the student, then you're making an error in who you chose to be the interviewer. So interviewer error comes two ways. It can come from the interviewer making a mistake, but can also come from who you chose to be the interviewer. And last but not least, a survey sent out by administration asks you to list any issues you have with instructors on campus. So tell us all your problems with instructors and then asks you about what you think they should, whether that you think they should deserve raises. So tell us all your problems with all your teachers and then do you think they deserve raises? Well, of course, because you've been given that negative mindset in that first bit, you're going to say they don't deserve anything because I'm thinking of all the problems I've had and not all the good things I've had with my professors. So that would be number seven, which is um, the wording of the questions. By first giving you wording that's negative about professors and then asking you about their pay raises, you're biasing your results in that way. And we're all done with section 1.5. I'll see you back here for more videos.